Good afternoon. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm so glad that you've joined us, whether you're here uh, today or watching on YouTube afterwards. We're grateful that uh, you've paid attention to this and hope that this question of how to engage within a community with the different types of organizations that are present within a community, different types of community foundations and other nonprofits uh, can really help to strengthen and improve a community. And with us today, I asked uh, Tristan Bassett of new, the new Sarnia Foundation. Uh, Sarnia is a community on uh, near Windsor, Ontario, near the Detro uh, border with Detroit, Michigan, uh, just across uh, the border in Canada. And it is an organization that is doing a lot of remarkable things. Uh, their website, newsarnia.org, uh, shows uh, and showcases a lot of what they've been doing. But one of the things that I love is I've been subscribed to their email newsletter and get these sort of uh, descriptions of active things that people can do to improve their community, uh, calls to action in various ways. And it really models a lot of really good engagement practices. I had the opportunity to meet Tristan as well as Ben Prince of New Sarnia on Zoom a number about a year and a half ago. And in that conversation, it was clear there was so much alignment. And so I wanted to ask Tristan, as the executive director of New Sarnia, uh, would you uh, do a, a little bit more of an introduction of yourself? Uh, what brought you to the role that you're currently in? And uh, just anything more that you want to share? Yeah, so as you said, my name is Tristan. I'm uh, the executive director of New Sarnia, which is um, a relatively young organization. Like you said, we met about a year and a half ago, and I think that that's when we were just getting, you know, up on our legs. And so um, we're new. A lot has happened in the past year or so. Uh, what drew me to the organization? So I actually was pregnant with my second uh, son when I met Ben, and I met him through the chair of the Blue Water Grand Fondo, which is a cycling event that happens here in Sarnia. I, I sat on the committee for a number of years and he introduced me to Ben and Ben had this idea, <clears throat> this idea of this strong town S, you know, organization or, or some work to be done and, and some initiatives that he was really passionate about. And when I first met him, I wasn't looking to, um, to work. I was going to stay home with my son and I was, you know, kind of going to take that path. And the more that I met with him and the more that he shared you know, Jeff Speck's Walkable Cities and some other books with me to read up on, I just really gravitated towards the vision that he was putting forth. And, you know, this is my community, this is where I'm going to raise my kids. And I really, really just quickly was so passionate about making these things happen and bringing them to life here. And so when we first started, we had probably 100 sticky notes on the wall of just things that we want to do or should be different or, you know, we could do. And, um, and so when we decided, you know what, let's really go for this. Let's, let's make this into an organization. Let's give it a name. Let's give it a logo. And, uh, and that's where new Sarnia was born. Um, and here we are. <laughs> and I, I love the, that evolution of a, of an idea into the actual organization. And I think to your point of, Sometimes you just need to pick a name, you know, create a logo and then go for it and, and try those uh, different aspects of, of what it takes. And uh, I'm struck by the way that it's described, like, how can we make Sarnia a place where our children want to stay to raise their own kids? And I just think that there's something really powerful because Sarnia, you know, uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the Canadian context, at times can have a reputation problem of, of sorts because it's got heavy industry. It's got some of the things that people would, you know, not necessarily associate at first glance with a strong livable community. But that's only because of the way in which a lot of our assumptions of what makes a good community have really been, I think, altered or tweaked. And what are the things that stand out that like so has made Sarnia have such lasting sort of um, uh, impact or power uh, uh, to hold people's imagination. My neighbor is from Sarnia and he is very proud of the fact that he's from Sarnia and said, you know, uh, it just like, it feels like it's ingrained in him. Why is that um, sense of belonging so critical? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's a small town and we've maintained our population of 75,000 people for over 20 years. So it's not a, an area that has experienced significant growth in the past. So I personally, I can't speak to everybody else, but I personally, I was born and raised here. And then I moved away, went to school, traveled, you know, did a bunch of things. And um, we call ourselves boomerang kids because we go away and then we come back to raise our own kids. And I think because there has been such little change, it almost holds that nostalgic um, 
feeling when you come home, not a lot changes here uh, for better or worse. Yeah. So I do think that that's why some people hold that such close affinity to their hometown um, when they return and it just feels just like they did when they were kids. So then how do you work within that landscape where there is perhaps a hesitation to embrace any kind of change, but the Sarnia or the new Sarnia Foundation says like, hey, there are good changes that we need to be making because that those are the pieces that, you know, bring new families in. That's uh, some of the situations that allow people to have a vision. Hey, this is a place where not only do I have a nostalgic connection, but sort of a present active concern. What are some of the initiatives that you've pursued in that front? So that's been uh, truly the biggest challenge is having people be able to visualize change um, because it's we're kind of adverse to this here as a community. Uh, I'll start by saying we've had the longest standing mayor. We Our mayor has been mayor of Sarnia for 36 years. And so that leads to everybody's face. <laughs> like, what? Uh, as you can imagine, that leads to uh, a certain, I guess, um, status or, or status quo that generally is followed. And so the the concern, you know, and something that I think people are really starting to realize here is we've got a local college, Lambton College, their international student program really, really blew up over the past few years. And so we're seeing significant growth with one particular demographic. Um, and we weren't prepared for them. And we, we don't really have the infrastructure, the housing, the services, the job opportunities, anything for them. And now people are, we're living in this situation and we're thinking like, oh, okay, well, what do we do, right? And it, on top of that, we're facing all of the other issues that smaller towns across Ontario and across Canada are facing um, with housing, you know, our downtown stores are vacant. Uh, we're, we're seeing all of the same things that many other um, communities are seeing. So one of the, one of the things that we've done kind of strategically with our social media is just plant kind of seeds of inspiration. So instead of asking people to change or adopt something here in Sarnia, we're just showing something really inspirational on our social media and say, hey, look at what Kelowna is doing or look at what this main street is doing. Where could we see that, you know, being a success in Sarnia and just getting that type of conversation started so that people can start to visualize maybe we could have something like that here. But we've been we've truly kind of tiptoed into those waters. Mm -hmm. Um, because we we just realized very early on <laughs> social media can be a bit of a tricky place to navigate. Um, and so the people who really are interested in change and interested in these types of ideas come and self-identify pretty quickly and sort of join our, you know, coalition and join our new Sarnia community. I'm fascinated by the sort of origin story of, you know, where it was, hey, this is a strong sort of opportunity for us. Let's take this on because it parallels a lot of what we've seen with um, uh, with, by means of a different route, the Sioux Falls, South Dakota group, where they were meeting together as a local conversation. So that was a, a distinctive sort of thing. They were just getting together in a coffee shop. We did a video about them a while ago, and it has turned into a much more formal organization. Uh, I can't remember what the, uh, the CRC, the Community for Revitalization and Change, I think it's called. And so they, they've become more formal. They've started to apply even for grants and things like that. And maybe I have a two part question. My first is like, what are some of the principles that um, really are are embedded in what you're doing as an organization? And then I want to talk about sort of the the gap or the transition from like a an informal organization, like a local conversation group to compared with and contrasted with the uh, formal organization as, as you've chosen to form. Sure. Um, so the yeah. first one oh. is what are the principles? Yeah. Yeah, I would say the principles that we are just always anchored by are what are the next quickest wins that we can have with the lowest barriers um, and the, uh, I guess, the, the path of least resistance for us to make some change now? So we've got some projects that we're working on longer term, but we're always kind of coming back to those core principles of let's make it community led. Let's make it, you know, small scale if we need to, or just something that is manageable um, and doable. And let's get it done, basically, is, is kind of our guiding, uh, our guiding principles. Now, 
I guess your second question about the difference between uh, local conversation and, um, you know, a, a structured organization. By structured organization, we're a small team, right? We've got a few people on board with us as a team. And we we do have that, you know, our co-funders who do provide financial backing to make sure that the wheels are always staying in motion. So we've got a project going right now. It's called the Midtown Trail Project. And we're doing a, a series of community-led tactical urbanism initiatives on this trail. And we've got about 40 volunteers who have come out to these workshops and they're working on, you know, a few different projects. And it's amazing to see them dedicate their time and their effort and their energy and their expertise. However, everybody's lives are busy. Everybody gets carried, you know, tied up with things. And, and I think the one difference with having a structured organization is that there's always those few people mm -hmm. who are going to be there no matter what, making sure that the wheels continue to turn and that, tasks are being done and deadlines are being met and things like that. So we're just really, really blessed to have that structure. But in terms of how we look at our projects or meet up and, um, you know, have some drinks and talk about things that we want to do, that's really no different. I would say that we function very similar to a local conversation. The difference is, is that we have people who have dedicated time um, to making sure that these things come into fruition. Yeah. And I'm fascinated because it, it feels like some seed money. I mean, in actually, this is actually has application to strong towns origins is that Chuck was just writing a blog talking about things almost in the equivalent of being like a local conversation leader, trying to stir up discussions. And then the Blandon foundation in Minnesota said, we're going to provide you with three years of seed money to basically provide for the hiring of an executive director and for Chuck to come on as the president. And that gave a window of opportunity. And from that, it sort of like got the ball rolling. And so it, and it sounds very similar to what you've described here where, yeah, because I lead a local conversation, we've been at it for several years in my community, but without any sort of, you know, formal, like, Hey, it is the, our expectation that this just gets done. Um, I feel like, you know, I had oftentimes have to just sacrifice like stuff that my local conversation could be doing and I just don't have the time for it. So it just doesn't get done, but it's different when somebody says, no, I've, I actually get to do this as like my day job and, and participate in that. And so if, if what, would you share a little bit more about like how that funding came about? Uh, what was the vision for it? Is there any, um, I mean, within limits, or is there any strings attached or is there something that like, or is it just like pure do gooderism money that has like fueled this? Yeah, like pure do gooderism. <laughs> so uh, basically the origin of it is that, um, as you know, Ben, uh, mm -hmm. Ben is probably the most passionate person about his community that I've ever met. Uh, and he is very philanthropic. Um, very generous with his time and his talent and uh, and his finances. And so he committed to, you know, um, basically the city and the community and doing what he can to give back to, to this space. Um, and uh, in his conversations about these types of things, met another co-funder who was equally passionate and the two of them agreed to commit to a certain amount of funding over the next number of years and see where it goes, right? See what can be done with it. But I think the power in having that joint partnership was really great too. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, as you said, that seed money just really helps to uh, get things moving because through the projects that we've been able to do just in the past year, we're now starting to receive donations through the community, yeah. which is amazing. We've got ourselves registered as a not-for-profit organization, so we can receive donations, we can give, you know, tax receipts and things like that. And so the community is starting to acknowledge us as uh, a place that they would like to invest in as well, which is so amazing. It's also given us, I think it's, it's allowed us to build a level of uh, trust in other groups that we have some, um, not formality, but some credibility. And now we've got other groups that are willing to partner with us on projects and we will equally contribute financially on things. So we're able to partner with um, government organizations or much more established groups than ourselves. And I think it's because we've been able to, to, to demonstrate some success through projects that have been funded by our original co-founders. Yeah. 
So what would you say to someone that said, I wish I had this in my community? Yeah, I would honestly say just talk to everybody and anybody because you really truly don't know what's in your community. I am blown away by the town that we have of 75,000 people. The people that I've met over the past year, I'm blown away. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't have ever expected to meet the people that I did um, if you we were having this conversation this time last year. And I just have a lot of coffee. I meet with people for coffee all the time. <laughs> and I found that a lot of my day ends up being a bit of a connector. Uh, and sometimes it's not even about New Sarnia, but sometimes it's just, you know, oh, you should know this person and you should know what they're doing. And that person can help you or this could be mutually beneficial and just getting the people to talk about what we're all doing. Uh, and it's all worked out really well for everybody, I think. And so my my biggest piece of advice um, would be just start talking. <laughs> and then I, I love that. And I think there's something so powerful where you never know like what can emerge out of it. And I mean, we're, and I, I often think if we had had a more structured local conversation program back in the day, it probably would have been the pre, the precedent for like a new Sarnia to emerge uh, because it's very much in, in that vein. And one of the things that you've done uh, as a foundation is to encourage people to make their themselves heard in favor of good changes within the community. So around bike lanes and a few other things. Um, how does that work as leading, in a sense, leading the charge or enabling people to become self-advocates for things that they really value? Um, I like, I get your emails and I'm inspired and I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't re email the mayor, but I'm tempted to just because they're so good. Like, how do you, how do you pull that? Um, I guess what, how do you look at that as a driving advocacy as, as an element of what you're doing? Yeah, that's a good question. And I can't take any credit for those because we have somebody now who, uh, writes our newsletters and I'm sure you've probably seen the evolution of them from when I used to write them. And now when Sam writes them, they've gotten a lot better. So <laughs> kudos to her for that. Um, I think what I've heard from other people is that they feel empowered or they get this next level of confidence because they know that it's, they're a part of our community. And so they're not reaching out to the mayor on their own right? They know that they've got the power of the new Sarnia group behind them as well, too. So we've just really been as supportive as we can for whatever concerns, ideas, thoughts people come to us with. And we try to work with them on, how, okay, so how can we turn this into something? How can mm. we turn this into action? And so when we send those newsletters out with a call to action, I think uh, mentally people know it's not, they're not uh, a man on an island, Right. So they know that that email has gone out to a number of people in our community. And so I feel like that offers a little bit more of a, a boost in confidence. Um, I don't know. It's a good question, though. Mm. And do you feel like there is any sort of. Um, I, how do I put this? Do you in, experience at times sort of an adversarial sort of relationship with some either groups or sort of loose entities and what have been some strategies for addressing that for example as, as a foundation you know strong towns will have this uh, we hosted a local conversation meetup in our community and we wanted to talk about a new residential development that was proposed for the town center and the first question was who's funding you and who are your directors and do you work for the development company and so we said actually no we've been a nonprofit society registered in bc here's our reports you can go check it out like we don't have a budget because we don't you know i think we had 150 dollars to like put on an event um i listed out like our director and what does what does that person do and and just to try to no inoculate against the the suspicion that somehow we're you know a shill for a you know um malign interest within the community in that in you know and we face a lot of adversarial sort of situations where people are getting their information online and and really come to very wrong conclusions but it's hard to dissuade them of that how do you handle that and and i guess as a foundation does that help you with that and and what what strategies do you have for that yeah that's a really good question because we definitely bumped into that uh right away yeah. <laughs> which i was unprepared for so we put out, one of our first projects was we put out a documentary. We worked with a local film company 
and we uh, put together a documentary just to explain who we are, right? Like what this is our vision. We interviewed some local people who um, who were kind of in our New Sarnia family and we just talked about our vision and we got a ton of flack for it. And I think what happened now in hindsight is that we really collided with the peak of the 15 minute city um, narrative that was going on at social media. And I say that because I, don't, I just don't hear it as much anymore. And so I feel like, you know, six to nine months ago, we, we were talking about that a lot. And our documentary got right rolled up into that. And so right away, as you said, it was who are you funded by? Like, does Klaus Schwab pay you? And yeah you know, just a lot of really hesitancy um, to understand us at all. And uh, so the way that we deal with it, um, I guess two ways, we're very politically neutral. We uh, understand everybody's perspectives and point of view. My response to those types of things online, we're always like, we don't want that either. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like we, we live here and we don't want any of those things either. And wouldn't the best way to protect ourselves from these types of things be becoming a more resilient community and getting to know your neighbors and being locally strong in terms of resources and knowledge and supplies and things like that. So we're kind of, we're working towards the thing that you're, uh, or like we're working against the thing that you're afraid of. Um, so we're all on the same team here. And so I think we really tried to take just the stance of we're all here together. We're all one community and we're not, this is not an us versus you type thing. However, um, social media is a weird place and you can't win them all, right? Like some people just aren't, they've got their mind made up and it doesn't matter what you say, they don't like you. And that's okay. <laughs> and I guess we just kind of realized like, okay. And so we stopped spinning our wheels on it and we stopped really focusing on it. And somebody somewhere along the way said to me, you know, these, the people, the, the chatter that you're hearing on social media, they're not going to show up and oppose something that you're doing, right? Like it's easy to write a comment or something like that, but are these people filling um, council chambers to really oppose some community led change that you are um, uh, adopting? And they, they were right because when we do things like, for example, that I, I um, pitched a proposal to council for a Canada day, temporary, like a pop-up bike lane. So I pitched a couple routes. Can we work together on just creating a, a pop-up bike lane? We don't have any protected bike lanes here in Sarnia. So it was a great opportunity for people to just get a feel for them, safely ride with their families. And it was kind of interesting because that was right around the time there was a lot of these conversations happening online. And it was like crickets. Nobody cared. At the end of the day, nobody really cared. Nobody said anything about it. And so we kind of truly just, we put our... Um, our thoughts out there and we're open to everybody. And I think if people are open to engaging in an actual conversation, we can find a common thread because we all care about our community. The fear of that conversation or that narrative is because we deeply care about where we live and protecting it. And that's what we want to do too. <laughs> so I think with people who are really interested in engaging and having a conversation, if we really distill it down, we can figure out something that we all actually care about um, and make change for the better. Yeah. And it's, it's to be able to be passionate about things without raising the temperature to the point where nothing can be done, like getting into a log jam. And I really appreciate that. And uh, to Lori's comment in the chat, Lori's in Penticton. And I know that there are in other communities, sometimes, especially when the city itself is leading a suggested change for bike lanes or other things like this, uh, that it has brought out you protesters, uh, the city of Cochrane in Alberta, that we were connecting with their uh, with their leadership and the mayor state of the city address became a point for a large rally opposing 15 minute cities, even though the mention of that, you know, there was no mention of anything like that in the mayor's materials. And yet one of the challenges with some groups will be that what you say is 
overlaid with, well, that's not actually what they mean. So that anything that is, you know, about an inviting community is somehow about immigration uh, in rather than like a very generous <laughs> understanding of, you know, when we talk about an inviting place or a safe place, we have the broadest sense of what we're looking for. We're seeking prosperity or, you know, the way that you've uh, summed it up to be a place where our children want to stay to raise their own kids. And we had at the little meetup that we hosted um, with the the folks, it was interesting because the there was a number of people that started by saying like, well, are you renters? And I was like, yeah, I'm a renter and others in the table. And it was like, well, then this is going to change the conversation. I was like, oh, really? And so it was, I, I had to actually like throttle down and try to just be very gentle and be very patient. And actually my co-director, she said like her little Apple watch told her that like her heart like rate was up above a certain level. Like she gets in because she and she wasn't like engaged deeply in the conversation to the point where, you know, she was losing it. She was like, I was just trying to figure out how to navigate that. And so I think that um, I wanted you to talk about like some of the participatory events that you guys have had the opportunity to do with volunteers and others, because I think that's one of the things that maybe can be missing when it's just conversation. How, how have you found mm -hmm. that like the participation of people to do things together has really helped? So when you and I spoke uh, a year and a half ago, I remember saying to you like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> like, We have no idea what to do now. Help us out. Uh, and you gave really, really good ideas. And the one thing that you said that really stuck with us was just look at what's already existing and find the gap, mm -hmm. right? And we we did, we literally did that. And so we looked at, we started with active transportation because the city of Sarnia was in the process last year of developing our very first active transportation master plan. And so again, if we're looking at quick wins or areas where we can easily have some impact, we thought, let's get on this active transportation so that we can um, be a part of this master plan process. Because once it's done and dusted, we don't have opportunity for the next few years. Like that plan is in place and it will be followed if it's adopted. And so we were looking at the current active transportation infrastructure that existed in the city, and we looked at those small gaps, right? How could we make this better, more usable, safer? Where can we make those connection nodes so that this, this path actually extends further throughout the city? Um, and that was one of our biggest first projects. And we worked really closely with the city to advocate for them to, to make those connections. And we've got this really beautiful path. Well, sorry, not beautiful. We've got this new path. Um, that goes from the college and meets up with our trail. I would say it's about a five kilometer stretch. Uh, we looked at that space and we thought, well, how how could that maybe expand? And how could that go further and further through the neighborhoods? Could we make this a bike friendly street? Could they maybe put a pedestrian crossing here? And, and just some quick wins, if you will. The path that exists as it is, it's um, people are using it a lot as a means to an end, right? Like it's not beautiful at all. It goes behind the Value Village and the Metro and it's there's garbage everywhere. There's no lighting like you use it because you have to, mm -hmm. not because you want to. And so we thought, you know what? This is a great place for the community. This is a blank canvas. This is a great place for the community to come together and put our unique handprints on this and make this a better place. And so we sent out an invite to all of these people that I've been having coffee with over the past year. And we said, hey, come on out and talk about this trail space with us. We printed out big maps of the trail space, like an overhead Google map. And we just said, like, let's brainstorm. What do we want to see back here? What would you guys do with this space? If money was no object, if we got all the approval in the world from the city, what could we do with this? And we just focused on one small parcel of land in the city. And we've created this project out of it. And so that group then met again and we distilled some of the ideas down. We got them into themes. Now they actually have projects. We've got public art, we've got environmental groups, we've got placemaking. And so they really just, I think by, by really <laughs> scaling down so much, we were able to give people something to focus on because when you look at all of the things, it's overwhelming and you don't know where to begin. But by giving people this, this one project, everybody's coming with their own ideas. We've got local artists, we've got people from the college, we've got business owners. So everybody's coming together 
to work on this space with their own particular objectives or talents or whatever. But that was our, our biggest way to get people involved. And now, now when we do, so for example, when we have a tree planting, now we can do a call for volunteers out of the larger group, you know, come on out for this day or, or things like that. And so just having that one simple project uh, allowed us to invite so many other people. Yeah. I, I, and trying to popularize the idea that we, our cities often will sort of paint a line on a map and then that's a trail and, um, or is designated as a mixed use path. And there might be elements of it that are truly a mixed use path and quite, a, quite useful. And then other sections that are the real like deal killers that just like really harm people. And I always think that we should call the like mid sections wherever it's missing, like a Muppet instead of a, a like a mixed use path. And then the Muppets are the parts that we need to fix, like all of which I know <laughs> is not going to be popularized, but um, I can't, you know, coin a new term like Chuck did. Um, but it is, it, to me, there's that, that identify are identifying where's that gap. And then, like you said, sometimes it's just as simple as a pedestrian crossing or maybe a bike activated uh, uh, transit um, intersection change or whatever uh, those things look like. Um, I wanna take up a question from Danny and then Danny, uh, after Tristan's comments, maybe um, unmute yourself and you can add some additional comments. He said, I'd like to hear more about the tactical urbanism. Do you wanna to touch on that, uh, Tristan? Yeah, so we started with a tactical urbanism project. We actually painted a bike lane on uh, the closest arterial road in my neighborhood. Uh, we painted it bright blue. And uh, there was about five of us. We painted a few blocks. Uh, it was an uh, interesting experience because we got to see how everything works with the city and the bylaw officers and things like that. And so um, since then, I would say that was kind of our kickoff tactical urbanism project. Since then, we uh, we sort of have done a series of smaller things. A lot of these projects that are going on on the trail will be tactical urbanism projects. Um, I think what we've learned is that tactical urbanism doesn't always have to be guerrilla urbanism so long as you create good trusting relationships with your uh, municipal staff and elected officials and city sh sanctioned committees. Um, and so we thought we have to go rogue to get anything done. We have to go rogue. We've got to do this dressed in black in the middle of the night. And I think we've just learned that there's an appetite for community led projects, but you've got to put in the time to build the relationship with these groups so that they understand what your values are um, and what your, your suggested outcomes are. And so, um, like I said, we did this first tactical urbanism project. We got big slaps on the wrist. Um, and six months later, we were partnering with the city on the pop-up bike lane. Yeah. And so uh, I think in our, our experience, there's a time and a place for all of it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're really trying to do, though, is actively encourage other people to start to take some of these things into their hands, too. Yeah. We don't always want these to be new Sarnia led projects or new Sarnia affiliated projects. And so a lot of the things that we do, we just kind of want to inspire other people to just, you know, you could order the stencil online, too, and get the chalk paint out kind of thing. Yeah, totally. And it's it's about creating a sense you are a steward of your community and someone that's able to like be a, not just a caretaker, but actually the cultivator of the things that make it better and, and stronger. And even just the recipe for um, corn starch and food coloring and water is amazing to paint on streets because it lasts way longer than just like paint or than um, uh, chalk but it will wash off. And so we did that for a block party. We had massive sort of murals and they lasted for like two or three weeks before the rain finally came in. It, it was such a life-giving sort of thing. Um, Danny, you I know that uh, tactical urbanism, all this is, is really something you're passionate about. Any, any further thoughts or questions? Well, that touched really well on uh, one of the projects I've been working on here is, is uh, painted bike lanes for a dangerous intersection that my wife bike commutes through three times a week and got to the point of, uh, how do I make paint? What kind of paint do I do? Do I put on the ninja outfit and go in the middle of the night? How much trouble will I get? And all of that stuff. Uh, my wife talked me out of doing that. And now we're, it's uh, putting in the time, going to the MPO meetings and going to the council meetings and finding the right committee to be in. That was a trick uh, that it seems to be slowly grinding along. Uh, but I, it's encouraging that you got some even with it that even going through that with uh, your county or the city 
that they're still they're still partnering with you and it shows you're serious about it and now you can get the next things done yeah and i think that the you know the ninja outfit has a place because it raises awareness and it puts the conversation on the table um and so in addition to us painting that bike lane we actually put up like delineator pedestals and that was their biggest so our blue paint is still there two years later i drive by it every single day right so um we put up these pedestals and i did a traffic count so i sat with like a radar a traffic radar and we looked at what the um, average speeds were before we put those up and then while the pedestals were up I put together a case study when we met with the engineering department and I said, I know you don't like us right now. I know we drilled into your road. I know we did a bad thing. However, speeds reduced by an average of seven kilometers during this week that we had this up. And that's nothing to, you know, shake your head up because that's a huge deal when we're talking a 40 kilometer residential space. And so that got a conversation started about these things are effective. We, it, and they're cheap they're not costly you know we could if we did it in the morning it can be done um and so i do think that it has a place because we've got to start somewhere and if that opens the door to the conversation with the engineering department or with the committee um then sometimes that's the best way to go about it now i'm especially intrigued so you purchased on your own dime or on the foundation's dime the plastic delineators and then installed them yeah, so the kind yeah. of funny, yes, we did. That's amazing. Um, and then when we did the Canada Day bike lanes, I actually, I think the city used them, yeah. uh, which was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, we did for, like I said, it was, um, I would say maybe three blocks. Yeah. Um, so. But that combined with providing then the immediate evidence and in a sense, creating mm -hmm. a public relations problem for a city staff that could otherwise just even not notice. I mean, people modify the roads every so often they'll, you know, um, they scrape their, bump, you know, their bumper and all of a sudden there's a gash. Like there's, there's always going to be sort of wear and tear and this could just be like chalked up to that. But then to be able to say like, this is making a demonstrable difference. And there would be a problem if it's the new story is, Local, you know, heroes try to do a good thing and city crews immediately come and tear it out. And I mean, there are many of those types of stories. And then that initiation of a cycle of like, how do we do the smallest thing, the quick wins, all of those types of, of things? Um, I just find that uh, to be fascinating. You've added one element, and then we'll go back to a couple of questions of providing grants. And that is something that an informal organization might find difficult to do, then it just looks like giving cash to people. Um, but you've done a grant process. Do you want to touch on why you think there's value in that and sort of what some of the early sort of uh, indicators of success with that are? So, yeah, we did put out a grant program. I will say we haven't received a lot of um, applications for the grant. And I think it's because what we're doing is truly so foreign to this community. Yeah. Uh, any grants that we have funded, it's through a conversation that I've already had with somebody. So, for example, we just funded two new bike racks at a local elementary school um, so that we would consider a local grant. Uh, we're putting together a like a, a bike rack grant for businesses because we're really doing a push for bike friendly businesses here. And so if you'd like to be a bike friendly business, one of the criteria is that you have to have bike storage. And if you can't um, uh, afford that, we would uh, we have a grant program where we would match the funds for the bike rack. And so we've started to kind of come up with a little bit more specific programming for our grants, but we'll, we'll provide grants to like the Mitten Village has a, an annual block party. So we'll provide a grant towards that event. We'll grant other cycling organizations events, but I would consider those more in line with a sponsorship. I would love to see local neighborhoods come to us and say, hey, I wanna paint a crosswalk uh, for my kid's school can you fund that or can we apply for a grant or something like that? So ideally that's what that's set up for is yeah. for us to help enable and empower uh, local residents to do these types of projects. We just haven't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, Lori Goldman is, uh, she leads up our heads up uh, First Things First Okanagan in, in Penticton, BC. Lori, do you wanna just jump in and offer some thoughts and, and questions or comments as well? 
Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is really exciting and great. And um, I'm very involved with our climate action group. And so I uh, we're working on getting fossil fuels out of new buildings and lobbying um, elected leaders. So although it's all intersectional, housing and, and good communities and tree canopy, um, I'm finding it a little hard to um, uh, create more uptake from the community for these types of things. Norm was uh, gracious enough to come and, and do a presentation to our, our um, new group called Penticton Neighborhood Association, but they are, are people below 50 with families and jobs, mm -hmm. and they are too busy to get too much organized, even though they have the concept and the feeling to make their our community better. I think they need to hear more, think more things like this, like what do we want to do in our little area, but they actually have to come together for the conversation. I don't see that happening. And that's a question I would have is how do we get more people involved? Our city put in a lake, we're between two lakes and they put in, and they went to the uh, citizens for consultation, but then they decided we're doing this lake to lake route and here you go. And the it went through downtown, it took away parking. There was so much backlash. And then a whole other area, they wanted to put in barriers and the whole city, that's why I said people do come out. The whole city, all of these older people came and said, if you have barriers, how are we gonna do street cleaning in the, in the winter with snow and we can't have barriers and everybody else is going, you know, barriers are protecting our children and our seniors. We have to have barriers on the road and the road is wide enough, but the pushback was volatile. I had to leave the room. Mm -hmm. It was so intense. And had they done it bit by bit by bit, it probably would have been easier. So that makes people a little afraid to move out. But to me, it's like, how do we get people to come and have these kind of conversations? Because now I want to go paint my road and make things like safer for crossing uh, streets and things. You've, you've really um, um, inspired me to, to do more, but I'm kind of tapped out. I'm getting burned out. I'm older. Mm -hmm. And uh, and focused on on this, and we really need the young energy coming together to do these types of of not just climate and trees and bikes. Uh, you know, it's it's all of this. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you. Uh, not not to say that people don't come out and oppose things in Sarnia because they certainly do. We've had bike lane proposals totally squashed because people would lose their on-street parking. So the one thing that I have found success with is pitching pilot. So it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. Try it out. If everybody hates mm -hmm. it, then we don't do it. But before we invest in million dollar infrastructure, why not try it out? And I find that that once people interact with it or they see the benefits of it, or they see that it's, you know, the negative things that they think are going to happen don't happen. It's a lot easier to then adopt it as a permanent infrastructure change. So whenever I'm, I've worked with the city or elected officials, I've always only ever proposed pilot um, and it depends on, you know, how, how long that temporary or short term could have different meanings for different projects. But I do think that that kind of quiets a lot of the opposition because it's not forever. It doesn't need to be there forever if nobody likes it. But what's the harm in trying it? Um, to answer your question about getting people out. So what I have found success with is that New Star we're really lucky because we're not tied to one industry or one initiative. So we work with our local climate action group as well, and they are specifically about the environment. We also work with our local so cycling organization who deals specifically with cycling. We're all things community building. So we're all things healthy, active, socially connected community, which allows us to really speak to what people care about. And 
and kind of morph ourselves into being relevant to the person that I'm in front of. So I'm going to talk about things to developers and the benefit of active transportation to developers differently than I'm going to talk about somebody who cares about our growing homeless population. So we're still doing the same things. I'm just presenting the information in a way that is in aligned with something that they really personally care about. And so this group that I mentioned that we brought together for the Midtown Trail Project, a lot of them are a part of these other organizations. So we've got people coming from Climate Action. We've got people from the Outdoors Club or, or from different community groups that all come with their own priorities and their own wishes. And we're all just working together to make that all happen. But I think that, um, you know, and even with talking to the counselors, when you know what their top priorities are, then you can kind of pitch your story to really fall in line with what it is that they care about. And then they're engaged and then they're bought in because you're helping to propel their work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And we we have a sitting city councilor as well as a member of municipal staff, uh, Matthias and Donna. Um, I would love uh, just, I think we've got a couple minutes yet. Um, either Donna or Matthias, do you want to share just from your perspective, either on the other side of the dais or the other side of the the bench or the um, the desk, I guess it would be. Um, Matthias dropped a couple of comments in there. Any any other thoughts or, or questions? I'll make a comment about what, um, what was presented. It's on point. I can say it's really on point. So Thank you for the presentation. Listen to what she said. I've tried to do that same kind of thing. I'm working to coach the local conversation, um, providing them with a heads up when there's planning um, commission information coming out. So yeah, it is working together and getting local groups together. It, it, that's how you build community. You know, when you talk about strong communities, that is based on conversations. And thank you so much. Hmm. What about for you, Matthias? Well, yeah, I, I guess I, there's a lot. There's a lot here. Uh, I would say, you know, with regards to people in opposition to things, um, they show up. They're loud. Um, and they are often, you know, just on social media, and that's as far as they're willing to go. I find that, or in my experience, I would say that people may be broadly in support of something um, and not and not show up because they, you know, they've either done the work or they'll participate. You might have a master plan or something that calls for, you know, an elaborate trail system and active transportation. They say, well, the work's done. We have it in the plan. It's We're good to go. But then when it actually comes to implementation, and the residents on that street are saying, no, we don't want to lose our parking. We don't want a bike lane here or whatever it might be. Well, they're the ones that show up. They're the ones that are loud at that point. And so it's, I think it's really, you know, the things that you're doing in Sarnia and, and having this like proactive, positive voice that provides sort of that political uh, uh, counterbalance to that you know, sort of reactive thing is is really very important. Um, you have to show up for those things and, and make that case. Because if the only people who show up are the ones saying no, then they're the ones who get heard. And it's really easy to just, uh, it, I, I would say it's really hard for political bodies to have those entities there, those people there, and still decide in, in opposition to them. To be able to look at back at that master plan and say, well, you know, we did call for it here. And so we're going to do it anyway kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the city I live in, Northfield, Minnesota, um, has been going through this. And the city council has taken a very strong stance that, no, we have a plan. We developed it. It had citizen input. And we're sticking to it, even though they, like, got sued over it and got petitions and, you know, on and on down the list. But that's a very rare, uh, I think, case. So that's, yeah, that's and and then again to just reiterate the the cities are often reactive they just have to be as the nature of you know spending tax dollars so being able to raise that problem um bring things to the forefront is is really critical because that's when the political body directs staff to do stuff that's when it happens you know if there isn't that political will from 
the elected officials, it's really tough to get things like that done. So, yeah, Tristan, thoughts? Yeah, we. It's interesting because once people started to hear more about what we were doing and what our vision with, right away people were saying, "Well, what can I do?" And I was saying, "I don't know." <laughs> So we've kept our thought is kind of, you know, keep people in the loop, keep them engaged, keep sending the newsletters, keep making the social media posts so that by the time we do have, you know, something that people need to come out for, we will have some people. And hopefully that voice that is in positive support of some of these changes can be louder than the voices that we know that will be there in the opposition. Um, I will say, like, I'm not a political person. I've never been to a council meeting before New Sarnia, and nor did I ever have a desire to. And I think that that's probably the, the slowest pickup that we'll get is if we say to people come out to this council meeting it's really important people don't go they may write a letter um they may reach out to a counselor specifically to meet for a coffee but to show up for that you know three maybe four hour meeting um i think people just don't understand the power of their presence and so they don't understand that they're they're just being there does it create that political will. So we're really encouraging people to use their voice. And that's why sometimes in our newsletters, we'll put a template email and we'll say, here's every elected official's email address. Here's a template email. If you are inclined to reach out about this, just copy and paste this and send it. And that kind of plants the seed of getting engaged in our local process and our local politics. Um, but I've found it to be a pretty slow going uh, engagement process. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, this is bringing back memories where we had there was a significant rezoning uh, decision around our local village uh, core, and it was really good stuff, lo lowering parking requirements, allowing uh, closer bu building back to the setbacks that historically were always there, a lot of things like this. And one of the strategies we took was we encouraged people to fill out a form letter, but instead of then compiling them and sending them all in one batch, I actually went like and printed them off and sort of dripped them into the mailbox at City Hall because otherwise what the clerks would do is they would bundle them and they would say, this was submitted by da, 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 da. And it just discounts it. And you're like, no, this is a person that has taken time to actually commit to this. And so being clever or careful about how you can like, actually just allow it to be the voice of a person rather than being cast under the shroud of, oh, this was submitted by the developer. And a lot of times developers will collect letters and people genuinely are in support of a project. And yet it's almost, well, of course they did. You know, they, they, it's probably friends, fa staff and family and um, trying to break out of that, I think is really critical, but in the time that we have, I, Tristan, this has been fantastic. I, I just think you've uh, opened up so many other ways for us to, kind of have, I think, expectations if if we could get groups organized in our community and even at times benefit from the formalization of, of turning it into a foundation and learning how to do that um, is, is so valuable. Do you have any closing thoughts as we uh, come to the top of the hour that uh, what would be your like call to action for the folks that are, are here as well as uh, those that are watching this afterwards? Yeah, I think it's really funny because I, when you asked me, Riyadh, I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about. We have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's kind of funny to be asked for advice or things like that, because we're just figuring it out as we go, right? Um, so I, I truly have uh, not a lot of wisdom behind me in this. Um, I guess I would just reiterate, you know, if you have something to say, connect with other uh, other groups, too, and other organizations that do exist in the community. Um, I've spoken to uh, service clubs, the Rotary, the Kiwanis, and, and really just try to get your message out off of social media um, as much as you can. My kids, I've talked to their teachers, their principals, and you just never know who's going to gravitate and, and be really passionate um, right there alongside with you. Oh, I love it. Um, that's a great point for us to conclude on. And Laurie, I took note of your comment about wanting to have Tristan present in your community as well. Uh, Tristan, there may be more requests uh, coming in because uh, truly, I mean, you may feel like you're you're piecing things together as, as you know, you're, what is the image of building the plane as you're flying it? Uh, but there's a lot of, I think, really well-grounded, strategically sound uh, insights in, in what you shared with us and, and the work that you're doing. So uh, keep it up. Thank you to everybody that was here. Uh, just as a 
programming note for next week is going to be sort of an open office hours. So every two or three, I'd like to have uh, guests and then also just have some open times where it's a much more, a little bit more casual, bring the question that's been burning in the back of your head, uh, bring that one. In two weeks time, I'm hoping to have someone from the city of Cincinnati who they, uh, the city of Cincinnati is not only the host of the national gathering, well, the city itself we will be in the city, but it's not hosted by the capital C city of Cincinnati. Wouldn't that be nice? But um, they've done some really cool things on different types of planning projects and uh, technical sort of street teams that go out and make immediate pedestrian safety improvements uh, within the city. And so I'm hoping to have Andrew from the city of Cincinnati on uh, to talk about that and talk about it sort of generally not in a way of like pitching what they've done, but saying like, what does change look like? What does that process entail? And so I hope in two weeks time, Time to be able to share that and yeah i'll send out an email on, on monday as well with the recording of the annual member meeting uh, we had a great member meeting yesterday but uh, lots of folks for lots of reasons couldn't make it so the recording's going out and i'll include a little blurb about office hours as well um on behalf of all of us i'm sure i can say uh we thoroughly enjoyed this tristan i uh, really appreciate your time uh and thanks everybody else for the contributions in the chat as well as uh, the comments too uh i this is one of my favorite hours of the week and so thanks for making it special appreciate your time have a good day everybody thanks Thank everybody you so much. thanks tristan